Welcome, everyone. My name is David Wolf. I'm uh, a member of the staff here at the Logan Center for the Arts and responsible for our visual arts programs in the exhibition space. Uh, welcome to uh, our uh, panel discussion this evening entitled Light Work, Black Art Practice in Contemporary America, moderated by Tracy D. Hall, featuring artists Delano Dunn, Stephen Flemister, James T. Green, and Lola Aisha Ogbara. Uh, if you haven't seen the exhibitions yet associated with all that light, um, uh, a 10 year retrospective of the Artist in Residence program, uh, please visit our gallery uh, on the first floor of this building and also uh, the uh, Arts and Public Life Gallery uh, on the Arts Block through September 11th. <clears throat> please also join us uh, Friday, September 9th at 7 p.m. for our culminating event, a performance showcase featuring Ya Agiman, Leroy Bach, Akil Charlton, AJ McLennan, Amina Ross, and Avery R. Young. The event will be preceded at 6 p.m. by a curator's walkthrough of the Logan Center Gallery with our curator, Tracy, and will be followed by an artist conversation moderated by our own Emily hooper Lansna of the Logan Center. Uh, you can register for that event uh, at artsandpubliclife.org slash all that light. Um, <clears throat> All That Light exhibitions uh, and its associated programs, such as this one, celebrate the Artist in Residence program, which is a joint project of Chicago's Arts and Public Life and the Center for Study of Race, Politics, and Culture. For the last decade, the program has centered black and brown artists working on Chicago's South Side. Ten years later, these Artist in Residence alumni are among Chicago, Chicago's most compelling and successful artists, continuing the rich and broad legacy of South Side cultural production that the program was designed to honor. Um, before I introduce Tracy Hall, uh, I'd like to first thank the sponsors of All That Light, uh, Chicago's Arts and Public Life, the Center for Study of Race, Politics, and Culture, and the Logan Center for the Arts, with funding from Raymond Iwanowski, Erica Noble, City of Chicago, Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events, and the Illinois Arts Council. Our moderator this evening, Tracy D. Hall, is an artist, arts administrator, curator, and librarian. She founded the Small but Influential Rootwork Gallery in Chicago in 2016, and is now the 10th Executive Director of the American Library Association, the oldest and largest library association in the world. Hall has also served as Director of the Joyce Foundation's Culture Program, as Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events for the City of Chicago, and in numerous other significant positions within Chicago's cultural landscape. Her curatorial projects include iconic Black Panther Chicago commemorating the 50th anniversary of the formation of the Black Panther Party in Illinois, Everyday Rituals, Bridging the Black Secular and the Divine, and Altar Call, the Architecture of Black Sacred Space. In 2019, she was listed among Chicago's 50 visual vanguards by New City. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to Tracy to get started. so much, David. I just want to echo again um, how amazing it has been to work with um, the incredible staff here at Arts and Public Life, the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture, and at the Logan uh, Center. It's just been um, an incredible experience to, to work with to work with people so dedicated and committed to showcasing um, uh, extraordinary art uh, in every way. So I just wanted to, to start by, by saying thank you. Thank you for all of your care uh, as administrators. And I also want to call out, shout out Tracy Matthews. Raise your hand. <laughs> Director of the Center for the City of Race, Politics, and Culture. So also um, real amazing. Uh, uh, visionary, um, and so it's just been incredible. Every time I see David and Tracy is also a good friend, I'm always saying thank you. You all are amazing to work with. Um, I also want to just, um, uh, before I get to the artists and some of the artists in the audience, I just want to thank you all for coming and spending your uh, Thursday afternoon with us. And I think, I think that we're not here by accident, so I'm hoping that uh, we will be able to get to a point a real uplift um, in the conversation. Uh, and of course, we'll um, provide space to invite you each into it. 
uh, but it, I don't believe at this point that anything's by accident. So I think they were all here on purpose. And, uh, and obviously, at least one of those purposes is to be really elevated by the conversation we're about to have. Um, I also want to take this moment to say, how many of you visited the exhibition, seen it already downstairs? It's a two-part, but how many of you have been to the downstairs gallery? Just raise your hand, okay. If you haven't, please get a chance, take some time before you head out, obviously, to see the work, because seeing is believing. And also, if you get a chance, uh, join us on uh, September 11th. September 9th, we're going to have a showcase of, um, of our performance-oriented artists who have participated uh, in um, the AIR residency. Uh, and I think that's going to be extraordinary. If you've heard that list of names, you already know what you're in for. But I also think it's important to get over to the Arts and Public Life Gallery, too, because really these exhibitions are connected, and each has a very specific energy, and they feed each other, and they speak to each other. So do get a chance. And I will be in conversation with Cecil McDonald, the amazing Cecil McDonald, on September 11th. That's the closing day of the exhibition. We'll start at 2 p.m. at Arts and Public Life. You know the arts incubator right there on Garfield. Uh, it's a packed, uh, a packed space. I mean, so each each of the artworks is speaking and speaking to each other. And then we'll come back here and we, we'll get a chance to, to really talk about the connections between the two. Um, so before we, we go up here, because I'm in awe of each of these people for uh, very specific reasons. Uh, but I also want to say there are some incredible artists, contributing artists, air residents in the audience. So I'm just going to ask them just to, to, to stand and just say their names because it's important to be added into the circle. So please. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll you yes, uh, beautiful work, uh, performance. Artist, uh, performer, musician, extraordinary, extraordinary vocalist, but also an extraordinary photographer, uh, whose whose work, whose portraits of his children in the Arts and Public Life uh, Gallery have made people sing, cry, smile, and uh, we we have more to see in that regard from you, Yao. So thank you for being here. Yes. Anna Martine Whitehead. Yay! Extraordinary movement um, artist and uh, whose poignant, riveting um, uh, work condensa, condensa is um, showing in our theater, but um, whose uh, whose piece um, from that film is really stopping tracks um, in the gallery. So you you have to see it. it. Occupies a very special space in the gallery. So do take a look. So thank you for being here. One of our uh, both uh, extraordinary uh, performers and performance artists in Chicago. So here we are, here we are. Oh, I cannot, we're about to get into this. Are you all ready? Yes. All right, you listen, you know how we get down, right? In Chicago, we go in there. Um, I wanna start because I think that every artist, every maker has a very specific origin story. And I really wanna be able to kind of get to that. I wanna ask by way of introduction, um, uh, starting maybe in order this time, uh, if you can talk a little bit about your origin story, like where you're from, what set you flowing, uh, when it comes to art, you know, who, what, where, um, and what have been the main influences in your art practice. And we're going to try to give you each about five minutes to kind of get into that because there's a lot, a lot of questions. But I think um, where you started and why and how is so important. So we'll start with you, Lola. Hello, everyone. Hello there. Yes. Um, my name is Lola Aisha Akbara. I was born and raised in Chicago. Um, spent a lot of time in St. Louis, Missouri as well. Um, but I found art in my youth. Um, as a child, I would say I was very quiet. I have grown mute at some times in my youth. Um, so I found art to be a communicative 
way to like express myself. Um, and it, it stayed with me. Um, they say once you're an artist, you know, as a kid, you kind of stay that way. Um, or don't, but I chose to stay that way. Um, you know, it started off storytelling, a lot of drawing, um, led to graphic design, um, led to photography, uh, led to sculpture, led to performance, led to sound. Um, there's a lot of things that I'm, I'm thinking about. Um, and so I use a lot of different mediums to kind of let that off. But um, yeah, my origin story is, you know, it's all over the place, but um, I didn't go to high school here. I went to high school downstate Illinois. A lot of people don't know that. Um, I went, I was in Alton, Illinois. Um, Edwardsville, Illinois, anybody familiar? Mm -hmm. Downstate Illinois? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, um, it's bumfuck Illinois. But <laughs> <laughs> um, I ended up coming back to Chicago for undergrad and I went to Columbia College um, where I studied art studied photography, graphic design, um, eventually landed on um, visual arts management. I kind of owe that as my beginnings as an arts administrator. That's my, my origin. Um, so I am an artist and an arts administrator. Um, Lola, can I ask a quick question? Because mm -hmm. uh, what you've contributed to the exhibition is um, extraordinary photography, right? That really challenges the notion of domesticity, right? And servility, and we'll talk more about that. But I was really curious because some of the techniques that you use are, of course, really complex and advanced, but who did you study with in terms of photography? That's the question I have for you. Hmm. That's a good question. I actually studied with Cecil McDonald <laughs> at oh. Columbia College. <laughs> When, that was before I changed my major and, and said that was too um, expensive <laughs> to kind of carry out as an undergrad. But um, I, wouldn't t I wouldn't call myself a photographer, actually. Um, I utilize photography um, more for documentation purposes. Um, because the photography that you see downstairs in the gallery um, is of a performance um, that was documented. And so, um, and I also had some help with that. Um, I would be what, a director, but I've also had a, a you know a film crew that was you know capturing the moment and producing um, in my name. But yeah, photography is yeah something I utilize from time to time. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we'll go ahead. All right, can everybody hear me okay? All right, cool, all right. All right, so I'm James T. Green. Um, I was born and raised in Joliet, Illinois. Um, so just, just down south of here. Lived in Chicago for a couple of years, and then um, I currently live in Brooklyn. Um, and yeah, my arts background, um, when I was a kid, I mostly, I, I was also very quiet. I was the oldest, I'm, I'm the oldest of three. So I found a way to like channel a lot of like anxious, nervous, caretaking energy um, into art. Um, so I used to make like these little picture books, but these picture books were really like kind of interesting in a way, like my parents would tell me. And they were basically just like recreations of things that I saw on the news. So I would, I would create these like four panel illustrations that were like basically advances of cable news narratives. And I would like make my own narratives in a way, which is like really wild to say out loud now. I, what I do now, which is mostly like media based art that sort of comments on, on like um, how we take in information and how information is delivered to us. And especially now with like algorithms and, and sort of like intense personalization. 
Um, what else? What else can I go to? Um, I, I studied at the University of St. Francis, which is this really tiny little school in Joliet, um, but it would have surprised had an art program. Um, but we had a lot of like professors that um, taught at SAIC in Columbia and were basically like, we'll just give you that education, but just like pay like a lot less. And I was like, okay, sick. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I just went to school just right where, right where I lived. Um, and, and yeah, I had like done a couple residencies. I had done the Acre um, artist residency. I've done um, the Chicago Arts Coalition residency. I've done uh, this residency in 2013, 2014, I believe what it was. Um, and then I've done a couple like audio-based residencies um, with the Third Coast um, Audio Group. Mm. Um, so yeah, my practice is mostly like very multidisciplinary. Um, currently, it's mostly like a lot of durational sound work, um, finding ways to make podcasts into like artistic works and mediums. Um, but I've done installation work. I've done. Um, uh, like digital manipulations, I've um, done animated GIFs, websites, um, like little kind of mobile appy type things, mm -hmm. uh, video work. Um, it's kind of a mixed bag. Well, I want to ask you, is there, can everybody hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to ask you this question because it's really interesting that you talk about the role of news and news media. That's really important to me coming from, you know, sort of the ways in which I'm kind of merging different areas of, of practice, you know, thinking about art and also thinking about information um, and information access. Uh, your work in arts and public life for me was really interesting because when I saw your work now to, to make this exhibition, um, some of the artists I've known for a long time and had an opportunity to work with or see, their, see the type of work that they make. Um, but James, I had heard a lot about. So when I saw the pieces that you were contributing, I imagined that they were like, re you know, forget about reading like scale, right? I imagine because they're testing these notions of masculinity, right? Especially black masculinity. So in my mind, I made them really big. <laughs> I was like, yes, forget what they say. You know, five by five, this is like, this has to be five feet. When it, it was, when, it, when the work arrived and I realized that it was five inches, <laughs> five <laughs> inches, I said, I had to see, you know how stuff sits you down, right? But it was so potent. This is what I'm saying. The potency of it and the use of color, right? Um, so we're talking about a triptych here and we're talking about orange, green, and purple. And one of the things that I live by in terms of metadata is I live by what the artist is asking for the curator to do. Like, I'm not gonna ever mess that up it, because I feel like that's a form of communication. But I wanna ask you about that because when you say that you were kind of really starting very, very much influenced by news and news media, your ability to communicate across very s small sort of like spatial types of context, but also too, like in your sound and the sound you make, it's like no mistaking that these are huge, huge ideas. And I, that's really hard to do. One thing I wanted to ask you is, you know, who are you watching like early on and today in terms of the way in which you communicate? And if you haven't seen this work, you have to see it because, um, you know, James, Lola, each, you know, everyone here has a, a, a potency to their practice that um, speaks really loud. But I was just so tripped up that these huge pieces in my mind were five by five inches. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I actually still have not seen the work physically, so, yeah. so I, I'm stoked. But you made it. So I'm stoked, I'm stoked to really see how it, how it turned out. out. Um, but no, I mean, um, I, I was formally trained as a, uh, as a graphic designer. Yes. Um, as, as, like, I, 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 I double majored in like graphic design practices and like computer development and conceptual art. Um, so I think like speak, like think, thinking of things and, and speaking in a very like kind of editorial <laughs> marketing style way, which I find really fascinating is something that is like a, a trade of mine that yes. I like to manipulate, and you know, when I was when I was like coming up in school, like you know, Jenny Holzer, uh, Barbara Kruger, like those types were like yes. very much my like 
I fucking love them, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I can see that. Yeah. As soon as you say those names, right? Holzer, right? You know, yes, thank you. Yeah, um, and as far as now, um, I've been, like, for, for the longest, I've always been, like, inspired by Martine Sims' work and, and um, Sandra Perry's work um, and also um, uh, Lorraine O'Grady's work, which, which heavily inspired the, the triptych. Um, I was thinking a lot about her piece, Cutting Out the New York Times, and thinking about, like, what does that look like in a now news feed algorithmically generated mm -hmm. um, matter, and basically, like, much in a way for that. Oh, well, 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 well. Yes, thank you for that. I mean, this is, you know, especially when we think about, you know, as we move to Stephen, because there's such a connection to, you know, uh, you know, Stephen, you're, you know, you like, I think, uh, thinking about Lola, you know, you are very facile sculptors. Um, you work in a lot of different ways, but you also work a lot with communication as well and thinking about digital platforms in your work. But just let's take us, just tell us a little bit about your origin story and we'll hear from you. Uh, thank you. Uh, greetings, everybody. Um, I am born and raised uh, southeast side of Chicago. Yeah, I want to say uh, <laughs> in short, uh, I probably represent. Uh, much of what you read and hear about, you know? I can say that I share that story as well. Um, just briefly, went to Kenwood, you know, high school, Columbia College, SAIC for finishing school. That's just typical Chicago stuff, I think. Um, when I was younger, um, I think that art uh, was very much uh, my form of distraction, I think, much like uh, what has been mentioned earlier is that uh, when alone in solace, you have uh, you know perhaps this personal skill that you may wish to develop. Uh, so uh, I did a lot of drawing, and uh, as it comes to form making and things, uh, you just got like discarded material uh, where I would just like shape uh, all sorts of toys and things that I didn't want to play with, but I think I just wanted to have it. I want I want a possession of it. And uh, so it wasn't until much later that I think I began to embrace perhaps that as, you know, my, I guess my core of making or something, uh, because um, until that point, um, I think that um, I really didn't understand the purpose of art, you know, uh, as I do today. I think that my practice has predominantly been uh, you know, again, as a Chicago bred person, uh, something that needs to uh, generate revenue, you know? Uh, so it needed to be very commercial. And, uh, or at least this is my perspective. I, you know, I, I got a bunch of friends who probably, like, absolutely, yeah, but. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, from that point, uh, you know, I think I just uh, began to, uh, understand that there were greater purposes for making work, I began to question, why do I make work? Uh, perhaps around 2013. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really got excited uh, from a number of programs. Uh, you know, I went to grad school and uh, fortunately uh, managed to be accepted into this program where I had like, you know, the time and the support to really uh, explore some of the things that did not have to necessitate you know, it, it didn't have to be tied into, uh, you know, financial return. And so, uh, you know, still I'm questioning, <laughs> you know, what that means and, uh, you know, why, why I make, you know, so, yeah. So one thing I wanted to ask you about in terms of sculpture and the way in which you work, and of course downstairs, Stephen has a bust and he uses cardboard and, and paper um, and at the same time, he really elevates the materials that he uses. So it seems that all busts should be made out of cardboard mm -hmm. and, and, and paper because he is so facile. And it's embarrassing to say this because Stephen is also too a long-term friend of mine as well, is that you know Stephen also too, I think, is probably one of our most virtuosic uh, um, painters, especially when it comes to portrait, probably in the country. And yet, you still, I think, you know, constantly are interrogating um, the your making, and it's very interesting because you've been making at a very, very high level, and certainly painting 
um, at an extremely high level, um, your ability to render, right, to draw. Um, uh, it is really interesting, and I think I've always been fascinated. Sometimes I've thought, is it humility? Or is there something that you're seeking from your practice that you're chasing? So I just want to ask you that, that question really bald. Like, we get, we get in there, right? Um, what is it that you're chasing, if you can even articulate it? <laughs> uh, that, that is a great question, uh, something that I continue to ask myself. Um, in short, uh, well, I, it, it's probably not going to be that short, but <laughs> um, I think as I think about that, uh, number one, as I was born and raised in Chicago uh, and went through certain schools, uh, I have been fortunate enough to share studio spaces with like amazing people. Uh, when I was at Columbia College, uh, Rashida and I, you know, we just awesome. like shared mm -hmm, all night, you know, uh, showed our first work together, you know. Yao, uh, he and I shared a space together, and uh, you know, not that I ever want to—I I don't believe I have that vocal, you know, you know, whatever. But like, I think being around uh, such amazing folks, Cecil McDonald, I feel like I've worked perhaps on uh, some projects just assisting him more than I have my own self, you know? And um, I think being around that kind of greatness, as a matter of fact, before uh, I had the, this residency, I want to say uh, each and every single uh, year, you know, I, I felt like there was a form of service that, you know, I was lending to, to friends, you know, uh, and not necessarily uh, the artists, you know? Uh, so I think that uh, I've always cherished that, and then I return uh, to what I'm doing, and um, you know, somewhere, <laughs> somewhere, I'm, I'm still trying to ask, uh, you know, why, why am I painting, or like, why am I creating this, and what what purpose does it serve? You know, who's the audience, and things of that nature, and and I may be perhaps uh, one of the most brutal in uh, critique, criticism, and things of that nature. So. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Patrick McCoy uh, once said that uh, uh, I was tortured, and I, I think I'm beginning to accept that now. You know, and I, not, not like I take it with pride, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's rough. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's really interesting, right? Because, um, you know, as we move on to Delano, I think, you know, there is this question about. Um, you know, obviously the marketplace, and we'll get into that, um, it's about survival and making a living. But, you know, it's also, as we've talked about more and more, I think, collectively, about legacy, right? And I think about the fact, you know, you are in some major collections, you know, and yet at the same time, it feels like each time you're making, it's like the first time I've had an opportunity to, to show your work as well, and the kinds of questions that you ask, um, you know, really are very, um, they come from a really genuine place. So it's, it's interesting and it's refreshing that people get more into it, but I wanna, I wanna, um, I wanna open the conversation up for uh, Delano because I have a lot of questions about um, what you've contributed and, and I want so much to get to know where your work is coming from because it packs such, you are able to talk about history um, in such a, uh, a, a really important and refreshing, but also it has a lot of gravitas, the way in which you approach. So we'll hear from Delano now. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is Delano Dunn. Uh, unlike the rest of the panelists, I am not from Chicago or Illinois. Uh, I grew up in Los Angeles and uh, went to school in New York and got a teaching fellowship at SEIC, which is what brought us out to uh, Chicago, which was great because I stayed way too long in New York. Um, I would say art came late in the sense that uh, through childhood into <clears throat> like high school, I didn't really particularly think I was going to be an artist. I thought I would probably go into like law or science or something like that. Um, and then I got really into comic books again. Yes. And then I thought, all right, I, maybe I'll go be a comic book artist. And then I got to school, and everyone was a great comic book artist. And they said, well, maybe I'll do um, 
editorial illustration. So I trained as an uh, illustrator and had a couple of really bad experiences and so decided to just go to a studio practice. Um, history is a big part of the practice. Um, I think you can't have any perspective on uh, current events if you have no knowledge of history. Because um, everything is cyclical, you know, all this stuff has happened before and you need to know about what's happened before so you can not make those mistakes. Um, yeah, I don't know. Does that get at everything or do I have to that? Okay. It does, but there's more. <laughs> that, yeah, I usually um, don't. I keep it short. There's a diptych, yeah. of course, you know, downstairs that you have an opportunity to see from uh, uh, as an example of, um, I think, Delano's work and I think um, mastery. But one thing about it that is really interesting is that it is telling a very specific story that is very resonant, obviously, um, for Chicago um, in terms of movement of people and. And, and flight and all of those things. But what I um, was really taken by is that you also use uh, glitter and, and, and confetti in a cartoon work. So instead of that, like adding like levity, right, to it, it packs a deeper punch because you use these really beautiful um, elements, attractive um, elements to tell a story that, you know, is is so familiar but all so gut-wrenching. And I just wanted to ask you um, about, about your use of materials. How many of you have seen that diptych downstairs, if you know what I'm talking about, right? Um, and there's many photographs of people studying it um, that we've seen earlier, um, if you watch this reel. I want to ask you about that piece in particular. Um, the material stuff comes from my grandfather. He uh, was like a jack of all trades. He could do anything. Um, and I would watch him as a kid in the backyard, you know, building random stuff with junk. And when I started to move into my studio practice, I didn't have a ton of money. And I had all this stuff left over from being an illustrator. And I thought, well, let me see what I've just got in the drawer and do something with it. And as I started to learn the materials, I started to become pretty selfish about wanting the materials to do something for me particularly. So in my thought process, I just said, no, this isn't, you're not a pencil in this case, this is what you are. Um, and that's how the materials started to develop. And uh, the studio kind of became like a science experiment. I would buy something, have no idea if it was gonna work, but wouldn't test it. I just wanted to use it and see if I could manipulate it in the moment. Uh, and in most cases, it works out. Um, in terms of the, the idea of flight, um, well, let me back up. In, in terms of the shininess of the work, I used to make a lot of references to candy. But in this case, um, if you want people to go see a movie, you make a, a trailer. And that trailer is sparkly, it's got explosions, it's got tons of great music, tons of great lines, people screaming, jumping out a window. And that attracts you. Um, and that's kind of what I'm after, because I'm gonna talk to you about some serious, heavy stuff. Um, and if I can't pull you in, then you're not gonna be receptive to hearing about uh, slavery or the history of, uh, black flight, you know, uh, which people don't really think about. Um, you know, there's other, there's all of these things that I'm wanting to tackle. Um, and I try to find stuff that's not, you know, like, obvious. Mm -hmm. uh, but that sparkle has to be there to suck you in. Mm -hmm. Glitter's a pretty recent addition. Uh, I don't really think I've got a great handle on it just yet. I don't know if I'll keep using it. <laughs> but it's, it's just another element to sort of catch your eye and bring you over so that I can trap you and talk about something. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, Delano, can I? Yes. One question. You sat back and you were sitting back and it's about, you sat back and said illustration. Uh, especially when you turned around and sat back and said about, uh, I think, you know, I could be wrong here with your dad when I'm definitely an uh, uh, illustrator as far as comic books. Okay. So when you say that, what do you mean by because there's so, been so many things 
about illustration from ever. I'm not that old, but <laughs> it's been back in the day where, wow, they pretty much went from, how, how do we say, the, I'm not, I'm not Marine, and I turn around and I sit back and I think about things when they sit back and say, wow, they did that back in the day and they did these books and how do you sit back and say, how do you feel? Or what do you sit back and say, this is what I want to do? And especially when you turn around and say it's about black, white, Asian people. You know what I mean? So you're, you're asking what, um, I, what I think of illustration? I do, I apologize. I should sit back and say, how do you feel about Because I'm, I'm, I really know. About illustration. Yeah. Love it. Okay. Um, I, I, you know, when I was doing it, I loved it. Yeah. And I apologize for that. Oh, it's okay. Uh, I loved it. And I still love to see people who are sticking with it. Um, it's gone from being something that was very, let's say, analog with the pencils and pens, which is how I was trained. Uh, I don't really work on a computer, but I've never really drawn on a computer. Um, and uh, that's cool, but I kind of like stuff that has uh, material that has history. Usually I won't pull any sort of digital artist for, for my materials, but no, I love it. I just think that um, cards were stacked against it once uh, the digital platform sort of came up and that was the end of illustration. What's, what's interesting is that if you think about and I, this, thank you for that. You know, this is what I love about Chicago. I really believe in call and response. One thing that I was thinking about, and let me get my thoughts straight, because it's like something right there I want to say, but I do want to talk about your work, uh, Delano, because I think there is an element of witness, right, in your work yeah. that is amplified by your use of, or your um, utilization of illustration. Right, um, and I, I want to say this. I don't want to sort of like lead you on or anything, but I think you'll know exactly what I'm saying when you see the piece. There is a insertion, if you will, of um, illustration that just amplifies what you're seeing. Almost like yes, what I'm seeing is so, and I think it's really brilliant. Um, and I, I think that we are also in. Chicago, where a lot of the material reality and history has been told through illustration and graphic arts. You know, we're at one of the epicenters early on in terms of um, thinking about um, black consumerism and all of the mechanisms and methodologies to inspire that. So we actually had a stronghold or a brain trust of black graphic artists and illustrators here in Chicago. So this is a very, you know, you're reading against a, a lived history for all of us. And I'm, a, I'm from LA too, so Are I'm coming to Chicago. Yeah, Did we talk about that? <laughs> yeah. I don't think we talked about that. Yeah. We really haven't, but we We're will. in LA though. We, huh? Where'd you grow up in LA? 103rd Street. Well, I grew up on 98th and oh. Bay Avenue. Damn it, I grew up on 88th Street. See, look at us. Oh, wow. It's a whole situation right here. Um, we have to talk about this, yeah. We really do, right? Because the odds must be in here. That's, that's okay. fair. Yeah. All right, that's another story. But I want to, but there is a through line, though, in this idea of graphic arts um, for, for, for this entire panel um, and your facility in that area. So I think I want to ask you all. Um, moving deeper into your residency, and I want to start with you, Lola, um, and hear what you have to say here, um, is how the residency both impacted your art practice, but also your understanding and knowledge of Chicago. Because I think that there's a, a, a dialectic that's happening, right? There's this dialogue, I should say, that's happening between the artist um, and, and the audience and, or, and the larger arts community in Chicago. How did the Air Residency specifically impact you and what effect has it had long-term on your practice? Yeah, the, the Air Residency <coughs> gave me an outlet. Um, I had just moved back from Chicago, actually, during that time. Um, I was a resident in 2021, um, so I was maybe like 10 months into Chicago, 
I had lived in St. Louis, Missouri for about seven years. Um, and I have and I have been there for you know quite some time, but I've lived through um, the Mike Brown riots, right? Um, 2014. And so that incident, you know, radicalized me and it radicalized my practice. Um, so by the time I got to the air residency, um, I was ready to say something, you know, I was ready to, okay, what I'm gonna, you know, this is kind of a homecoming project for me, because I've came home. Um, I lost my grandmother during the pandemic, um, so that was, thank you, um, that was um, kind of an inspiration to me as well, to kind of honor her. Um, it was also me coming back to Chicago and noticing how a lot of things have changed, some of the neighborhoods I had become used to in the past have changed dr drastically um, throughout the years. Um, a lot of familiar things, but a lot of unfamiliar things. It was a very uncanny experience. And so the Air Residency kind of gave me an opportunity to say something differently um, than how I've, I've been saying things. Um, and you Give see, us some examples. Yeah, so, um, my main medium is ceramic sculpture. Um, and for my project, for you know, the things I've been thinking about, um, I was thinking about performance. I've never done performance before. So the Air Residency was kind of um, a place, an incubating place, right, to experiment with different mediums. Um, so I, I took that on um, and used, and utilized you know, photography um, as well as film crews in like, thinking about a multifaceted way of talking about uh, one thing or many things. Um, I chose to kind of commemorate um, domestic workers mm -hmm. um, and maids, um, particularly during a time during the industrial era um, where those maids weren't quite recognized. Um, I spent my time focusing on the Pullman historic site mm -hmm. and kind of going back to those areas um, because I grew up in Roseland, you know, Morgan Park area. And so that kind of has always been there as a kid, like the Pullman historic site. Um, I've always noticed it, but I never quite indulged in it. And so um, I was curious, you know, coming back home, I wanted to know about these things and I, I wanted to know about a lot of other things, but um, my, my grandmothers were maids, right? My great-grandmother was a maid, a domestic worker. Um, so it was me kind of commemorating them. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I can get into it. Mm -hmm. I have slides. Yes. <laughs> um, I can get, really get into it. Um, but um, to answer your question, that was my, my, my something different, uh, a chance to, um, have a layered conversation, a very complex conversation. Um, I went back to some of these areas, um, went to the Steelworkers Park, mm -hmm. uh, went to um, Prairie Avenue, which was once known as Millionaire's Row, um, all of these places to kind of, you know, mm -hmm. roll in the lands of sorts, you know. Um, One thing to think about, too, when you think about domestic <laughs> service is that, you know, right there, I think it is right there on Michigan and um, Michigan and Roosevelt is an area where black women who were day workers would go and stand to be picked up just for day work. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, and a lot of people have talked about, those who know that history, have talked about whether or not there should be a monument for that because many of those, many of those women, you know, helped uh, to support, you know, some of the evolution of the wealthiest families, right, in Chicago. So um, I think that as we get after this next line of questions, I'll ask David to help us take a look at your slides. Yeah. Um, Stephen, do you want to um, jump into that, and then we'll go to we'll go to Delano and then James. Um, my experience at the incubator. At the incubator, and also <laughs> to maybe for your engagement with the public, with mm -hmm. the with the community around the, and beyond the incubator? Yeah, um, foolishly, uh, <laughs> I gotta start out foolishly. Um, I uh, began uh, my residency at the incubator and uh, had this plan 
where I had these projects and I had envisioned how I would incorporate the community. Um, I say foolishly because uh, I learned very quickly uh, that uh, these are my neighbors and uh, <laughs> uh, the proposals and the letters and things that I would send to folk, you know, trying to have them buy in on my projects just wasn't happening. So um, I was perhaps, uh, you know, I, 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 I pick up things real slow. Uh, so I think by the end of the residency, I, you know, I'm just asking like, dude, what are you doing? Uh, you haven't really uh, joined and asked uh, perhaps how you could be of service in some regard. And uh, honestly, I think that uh, the experiences that I most had was uh, literally the day-to-day the -day conversations with folk across the street uh, dealing with portraits. One example, uh, you know, I remember uh, doing an invite, which I'm extremely terrible with uh, announcements publicly. Uh, I'm, I'm quiet beyond uh, anybody's <laughs> imagination. Um, I put out an invite or something to call some folk uh, to uh, be photographed so I could do some screen print process because, you know, I had like all these ideas of making like these really robust uh, prints. Um, and uh, I just remember uh, perhaps about three or four individuals and they had their picture taken and they looked and they were like, yeah, that's nice. Uh, why don't you email or text me that? And that was it, you know? And uh, invited them to the exhibit to see some of the prints and things. They, they didn't care about that, you know? Uh, we were just catching up from last week and things. So um, I think that uh, moving forward, um, just thinking about the community involvement, um, I was just reminded that uh, I shouldn't expect to write some proposal, you know, and uh, just expect doors to open and things like that. Uh, I should have sat in, I should have joined in, volunteered, something along those lines, and perhaps see how it could have been a service if I was really interested in, uh, you know, having them involved in something that I was doing. Uh, but aside from that, the facility, um, 2 a.m. in the morning, you know, uh, you know, cutting wood and everything like that. Yeah, that, that was, uh, I miss that dearly, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Thank you. Delano. Um, my experience along with Martins is a little bit of an outlier. Were you both in the same cohort? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, I came to APL uh, in 2019. Uh, we had just moved from New York. Um, I didn't really know anything about the art world, nor did I know anything really about Chicago. And so I thought, well, let me apply to something that is going to get me sort of like on the ground immediately. And so I did. I didn't really think I had a shot because I had no history with Chicago. So I was very happy. Um, and then about six months in, all hell breaks loose, and we get this COVID going, and for uh, us, it just kind of shuts down. Um, I had big plans before I got in. I was gonna really use the uh, archive here. Had no access to that, but uh, the team at APL were great. They provided us still with a, a lot of funding and a lot of opportunities to, to do what we needed to do. Um, in terms of my public program, initially it was going to be a gumbo social. So I was gonna open my doors with my studio, invite people from the neighborhood to come in and eat gumbo and walk around and talk, you know, which kind of uh, is the way it happens when I was a kid. Like my mom would make gumbo and everyone would know about it in the block. And then people would just so happen to walk by and go like, I am when you cook. <laughs> so um, I thought, well, I'll try to recreate that. I think the weekend it was supposed to happen, it got canceled because of COVID. Um, had you already bought the seafood? <laughs> no, I haven't. I had not. But I had bought a bunch of other stuff, but not the seafood. Um, and so I thought, well, I guess there's going to be no public program. But I was able to work something out uh, with Brett, who I think is gone now. Um, and so we did a virtual uh, gumbo hangout. So I made gumbo. It was a 10-hour uh, live streamed event. <laughs> Ten hours. That's how long it takes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. 
uh, and we made gumbo. Uh, I had people coming in and out of the kitchen. I had friends calling in. My mom called in, talked about how she makes her gumbo, gave me some flack because I had tweaked the recipe a little bit. Um, but she did too. She did something which I don't know if anyone here makes gumbo, which I think is egregious. She took one of the Holy Trinities out of it. Thank you. Thank you. It was celery. And I said to her, no, 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 I'm not wrong here. It's in there. It's part of the Holy Trinity. Uh, but she didn't want to hear it. Um, and so I still get flagged from her about that. But I brought the recipe back to where it was supposed to be. Come on. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. So, yeah. 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 Did she always not cook with celery? Is that like her thing? I think she's lost her mind. Because when I was a kid, she cooked with celery. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing it. You know? She's just, she's crazy. So, <laughs> so that's what the event was like. Yes. And my mom called in. I had friends who were uh, other, who were also were cooks calling in, talking about their family traditions with food and whatnot. Um, and I should back up a little bit. I had pivoted from my project to make works about gumbo. Mm. Um, and so I finished those works up, and that was why uh, it led to the Gumbo Social, but it still was great. I had a lot of fun. I was exhausted, but I think people who called in and asked questions about Gumbo uh, had a good time, hopefully. And I know I owe some people in the crowd some Gumbo. I think Tracy I yes. owe some Gumbo. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you for that. Amazing. So I had first got, um, like, involved in introduced to arts and public life through um, uh, Lakeisha Leak's um, How to Make a Hood um, exhibition. And, and she had invited me to do, um, to show this like early video that I had shot where it was just like a simple two minute looping shot of a, um, an open sign that was blinking upon a, um, an opposite wall, so it was just like the camera on the opposite wall, and it was like um, it was illuminating like the block that my grandfather had lived on, and it was like a block that like a lot of like characters are coming in on. I just thought formally, I thought it was like a beautiful uh, still, and the way that Lakeisha had uh, presented it was uh, she presented it in the window mm -hmm. um, of the arts incubator. So then, like as the sun came down, the block like my block from my childhood became the block on, uh, in, uh, in the neighborhood. Um, and I thought that was really formally beautiful and I was like, all right, I need to like do something with, like, with the art space like in this neighborhood, especially because it reminded me a lot of the neighborhood, um, even like visually and everything in, in, like, in this area of Joliet that I lived in. So it was like something that really like was drawn to me just as far as like I'm feeling some kind of energy whenever I get off like the red and the green line and, and I'm like, something's there. So that's what I was like really interested in, in like tapping into with um, my time at the residency. Um, and I was there in the peak of, 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 of I believe it was Michael Brown. Um, mm -hmm. And like I had a plan as well that was like, all right, I'm gonna do something completely, like I'm gonna try out like all these like really kind of strange, just like formalist digital works and then that happened and then I too got like really radicalized and pretty much threw everything out the window. And, and I shared a studio space with David Leggett. And, um, and that was very interesting because David is so physical in, in, in his work. And I'm so digital, so it was like literally the way that the studio was kind of split up is like every time I would go in, I would just have this desk and a laptop and like an iPad, and that would just pretty much just be me working. And behind me would just be these giant, huge panels in progress. <laughs> so that definitely inspired me for my um, for my exhibition, um, where I. Um, like worked physically for the first time in quite some time. Mm. And I, I made these like very large sort of pasteboard-esque panels utilizing these digital manipulations of, 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 um, of AI generated um, like clone stamps of protest photos. Mm. So then I made them into like a pasteboard kind of effect on these giant panels and slowly let them 
dissolve and fall through the gallery as people walk in over the time. Um, so I was like, I was really inspired by like all the construction and kind of also critiquing it in a way of like all the construction that was happening around in the in the, in the neighborhood and it was like kind of like bringing that construction inside. Um, there was another piece that I had done um, where I believe I faced it out to the window, but they were these LED um, panels that I was really inspired by all the corner stores that were like um, sort of um, um, you know advertising their goods and stuff, and um, and I had placed um, Darren Wilson's um, testimony as this like scrawling news graphic that just kind of like went across the gallery space that then like filled out, and then as far as like the engagement process, like I built this website um, that people, once they go to the gallery, they can say what it is that they did that night of like the, um, of the verdict. And then that mm -hmm. then populated into this video piece um, that was a live a recording of a live stream I had done of me watching the verdict and utilizing some code. It took those responses and then made them into a news crawl that then went underneath my face. So then as the exhibition went on and very much inspired by Lakeisha's like curatorial decision, their responses would be visible from yeah. the street. Um, so it, I kind of like made it as like a hoax of being like, okay, like this is a community that are then saying like what is that they're feeling during this moment, and um, and they can even access the website from their phones or or any other device. Um, but yeah, it was it was one of those things that um, like being. Like I had done residencies like on the north side, west side, and kind of like all those things, but like actually like really being rooted like in in the south side and like spending the extended time there had really like changed like how I like approached my work and made it much more um, like less online and more just kind of like right there in the community. So yeah, 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 much more engaged and responsive. Um, so, <laughs> I to, so I have two more questions, and we, we've done a, a really good job of, um, I want to just thank the artists because I, I had some very specific questions for each of them about their practice that they were able to integrate, you know, really telling you how they work and how they were working uh, in, uh, during their residency. But before I go to um, maybe my last two questions, I wanted to ask you all, who has a question for, are there questions for, for anyone in particular, or yes? My question is for Delano. Uh, quite a while ago, I curated an exhibit of black images and comic strips and comic books. And I wanted to know, were you in any way influenced by or familiar with either the narrative uh, comic strips of Tom Felix, comic travel in the world of Negro history from the early 60s, or the event comic strips of uh, Maury Turner with his wee pals in the late late 60s. Do you connect up to hit your history interest with the way they presented their history? I can't say I know either of the two that you mentioned. Um, <clears throat> uh, so I guess I'll I guess I'll talk about my history with comics. Maybe that answers. Yeah, how, how you related your interest in history into the comic books or gotcha. the comic stuff. Great question. Okay. Um, there, what started this was me going to this, I was in New York and I went to a comic book shop at like midnight. Um, and there was a comic book, um, Classics Illustrated, part one of the history of African Americans. No one African American touched the book. But I bought it. And I just wanted to go and see like how the history was presented. It was awful. Um, and so I decided to start finding comics that had, you know, history with African Americans. Uh, there was the Golden, Golden Legacy. Thank you, Golden Legacy Publishing, which is all by African Americans, um, and they presented a history that was much more realistic. Um, and so as I started to incorporate comics more into the work, I started pulling, you know, visuals from that. And then I would also pull visuals from other classics illustrated that had African Americans in it. However, they were not presented in any sort of flattering way. They were kind of like 
something that was kicked over to the side. Mm. Uh, the most amazing one was a history of the United States, not a single mention, nor an image of an African American is in it. And I, I still have it. I haven't figured out exactly yet how I can use it. Um, but I just thought that was just hilarious. You know, how can you talk about American history without talking about black history? Um, so I think there's a, I think comics at times can be, you know, like a little time capsule of what was going on, whether it meant to or not. Um, but I think that it's, I think that people, you know, take advantage of it. They think, oh, it's just the funny books or whatever. But there's a lot of important stuff that is documented in comics. You know, you can even talk about Mouse, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I just, I love comics, I love reading, and I always find parallels and stuff, you yeah. That's a great question. I see one over here, thank you. Um, so, I'm just responding to something that you said earlier, talking about um, the digitalization of illustration. Yeah. Um, so back when I was in high school, um, we had to do drafting mm -hmm. by hand. Yep. But I really found it calming because it was a ritual about it. Like first you had to prepare your paper for the tape down, mm -hmm. and then you measure the border. The border had to be exact because your teacher came along with the ruler. Yeah. So do you feel like the ritual of hand drawing um, is lost with the digitalization of art? Yes. <laughs> and the reason why, the reason why is because the stakes aren't high anymore. Yeah. You can, you can sort of, you know, it can be sort of meditative to draw and to, to, to you know, to use your hand, but you know at the same time, like, I've got to try to get this correct, otherwise I have to, you know, depending on whatever medium I'm using, I'm gonna throw away and start it again. Um, it doesn't work that way with the digital, unless you sort of set those parameters that every time I make one mistake that I can't really correct in life, then I would just delete the file and start over again. Um, yeah, but I think it, the stakes aren't high, it loses, it loses the artist's hand in some, in some way, um, and it's not, as, it's not as meditative, you know? I mean, I could go on about my students who hand draw versus those who do digital. Um, but personally, I, I grew up taking drafting class, and I'm just an old soul when it comes to that. Like, that's where I like it. Yeah. Stephen, can I ask you, and we'll take one more, and then I will come back. So please get ready. I'm queuing you up. I want to ask you that same question. And, you know, I, I could ask each of you. But one thing I think about is because you are, you know, obviously, you know, a painter. Uh, and you know, paint a great deal of portraits, and you also spend a lot of time in the digital space. So I just want to ask you that same question: Are they are they competing, or are they different tools? Uh, I think, respectively, they are not competing. Uh, I think they're different in the sense of uh, just a different time and day. Um, mm -hmm. I think that I am becoming more of an individual embracing uh, folk who are doing digital illustration because uh, what may have been perhaps a pack of repeated graphs and pencils and things, uh, this is easily accessible, you know, mm -hmm. virtually. True, very true. And, um, you know, I have to say, I, I absolutely, I mean, like, you know, uh, much of the things that you mentioned in, in terms of your architectural or your drafting experience, I mean, like, there's no replication for that. Um, however, you know, there's just so many new and exciting things with the new media. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they, they're just two different types of things uh, that can offer, uh, you know, certain uniqueness, you know. Uh, one records in a way that just, you know, you, you can't really, you can't really replicate, you know, lead or graphite on, you know, a paper surface or something along those lines, or like ink mistakes, you know, dragging by the hand and things like that, you know. Uh, but uh, electronically, you know, how you can perhaps, uh, you know, illustrate a comic and it could be viral within minutes, mm -hmm. you know, is amazing, you know, mm -hmm. so. And, and then with the full, you know, kind of breadth of, uh, you know, something like an airbrush virtually, and you know, enough control and things like that. So, yeah. 
I want to maybe um, gear whatever next question we have towards uh, uh, James and Lola. But one thing I think about, you know, with that is that I, I'm a librarian and I work in an association, and people ask me all the time, well, people don't read anymore. Are you concerned? I said, no, people read all day, every day. The first thing when people wake up is they reach for their phone. They're reading constantly. It's just that the container has shifted. Shifted, And so I'm always thinking about that. I'm very interested in, in this question. And recently I was watching Timberland, the producer, and somebody was saying, well, you know, isn't what you're doing less, you know, is it less artistic than a musician? He said, no, I'm actually listening to what they've created, and I'm creating a synthesis in a different way. So we are all musicians, but we are using different tools. So it's just a very interesting question, and I thank you so much. I'm loving the questions that you all are generating. So I see, I see your hand, and I see two hands, and we're gonna, we're gonna uh, gear them uh, towards Lola and Jane, so please. For sure, I have a question for James. Um, so it's, you say um, that your practice has recently been more radicalized as it relates to new media and technology. Um, and that just made me think of, you know, how when sometimes you use like the automatic scenes and, you know, they don't really like turn on for us because it's not made for us, right? <laughs> or um, different filters on Instagram and lighting your skin, your eyes and all that. So my question was, how do you incorporate that within you know the certain technologies that you use in your practice so if, as far as like um, the coding or a different apps that you make how do you push back on the ingrained like systemic racism that is prevalent throughout you know our technological practices yeah yeah good question yeah no, that's a really good question uh, it, it takes a lot of reading and research I read a lot of like really boring papers for fun, <laughs> like books for fun. Um, I, I try a lot of experiments where I'll do like information audits on myself, where I'll do spreadsheets about like where am I getting like certain information from, and then I'll like spend a day a week like actually like looking into like what are the practices that go into like these um, these companies, like looking into like you know. Who, who I give my money to hosting for, for, for things, who am I using um, for, uh, for like certain applications, or, uh, or like who, who's really behind those things. Um, whenever I have a moment like that, like for instance, like, the, like maybe the, uh, the, the sensor not working and sort of pissing me off, or like realizing that like the exposure on, on a camera is not picking me up, I'll usually make a note of it and try to like be like, what is it that makes me so mad about this? And then see if I can make it into some sort of artistic gesture. Um, it, was, it was kind of what I was um, getting at with the work that I made for this show when, um, when, I, when I was doing these uh, um, essentially like digital news cutouts um, and, and sort of cutting around extraneous words and then leaving sort of the words that have been left because I was really I was really wondering and concerned about like my news app particularly was like showing me things that I didn't necessarily know about myself but then was kind of shifting me into a direction that um, maybe I was uncomfortable with and I was trying to like push back on it and expose it so like it's funny y'all were talking about like the digital illustration tools I was like I love them and, <laughs> and, and use them particularly for that um, so yeah it's like a moment in which like anytime I notice myself running on autopilot with digital products or tools I then kind of like investigate myself and I'm like all right why am I running on autopilot how can I do this sort of manually how can I push back um, and then find out like where the money flows, because usually that's like the point where I can know who to be mad at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Do you? Is there a, any other questions? Any questions specifically for Lola? Yes. Um, I was gonna ask specifically about your time in the arts and theater. I feel like that applies to anybody, but like you were in particular were doing work of different sites that you used to. Uh, that have changed over the years. And I was wondering uh, if there was any engagement with the neighbors around uh, the incubator and then what methods you used to actually get into contact with people living there and then like, sorry, this is a very long question. And then how uh, far out from 
in the neighborhood did you go to talk to people, if at all? Um, for my project in particular, the artistic realm of it um, did not have too much of the community in it. It was uh, more commemorative. Um, the performance aspect of the project, um, I didn't have an audience. Um, that's where the documentation came in. Um, I did, however, include community through the programming I was doing. Um, I created a program called Community Care and Comfort. Um, that program, and yeah, one of my, uh, <laughs> my participants. <laughs> but yeah, I invited artists from different communities in Chicago to kind of join me um, in a kind of a communal um, kind of self-care practice. Um, and we all cooked a meal um, via Zoom. Um, so I invited um, a lead artist to kind of talk about their practice, provide a recipe, um, and why, and, you know, their emotional connection to that recipe, um, why they chose it, and to talk, kind of talk about themselves and their communities and what they do. Um, and the rest of us, four of us, kind of followed along. Um, Delena was also a part of that project, too. Um, so um, that was more of my outreach to the community and, and hearing how they needed self-care or what kind of care they needed. Um, it also provided a chance for people to kind of start cooking for themselves again and taking care of themselves. Um, I'm all for you know the rest that we need to take collectively and individually. I think that is one major theme of my work um, is rest as resistance. Um, so I wanted to kind of focus in on that um, as far as a community building aspect of my work. So um, we definitely want to see Lola's um, work uh, before we head out. Uh, and I also want to make sure that um, we can uh, also just invite everybody to the gallery if you haven't had the opportunity before you head out. But I wanted to, to move a little bit um, into, um, I think, what the experience of air has yielded, right? What the experiment of it has yielded is, I think, this concentration of talent and, um, and also to talent that is now all over um, the country. And, and that's one thing that we you know, have found and, and been tracking. And also, I think, um, a, a real recognition of the type of artistic talent, um, BIPOC, Black, um, Latino, um, Latina, especially in terms of um, uh, Asian, Arab, et cetera, that um, exist in Chicago. Uh, and, and I think that um, a recognition of the heft of it. So I wanna ask you something that I think uh, Stephen brought up in terms of making a living, right? And before we started, you and I were talking, Lola and I were talking about um, the kind of work that artists make um, to be able to continue to make work and, and sometimes how that contrasts or compares um, to the type of art that artists are making to ask questions um, and, and to contribute to and expand the conversation um, around art and life and history. And as I was thinking about light, which is very much um, the sort of starting point for, the, for this exhibition, and it comes from a conversation in which, um, with um, some of the administrators, including Jacqueline Stewart, and of course the Astor Gates and others, um, in which I think I commented, but it was documented by uh, Emily Lanzana, um, in which I, I asked about the accumulation of all that light, right? And I didn't even hear it, but it is something that I think a lot about when I think about the kind of cumulative talent. But I also think about light and shadow. So I want to ask about, about that part of it, because there is a, a quote of Sojourner Truths in which um, she is said to have said that I sell the shadow to support the substance. 
And she, of course, is one of our early, she and Frederick Douglass, social media influencers in that she's creating books and photographs um, of herself to sell and to introduce as her calling card all across the country as part of her lectures. And of course, she gets this idea from Frederick Douglass, who it, during his time was the most photographed uh, um, uh, man of any race um, and who commissioned photographs very deliberately of himself. And again, this idea of introducing himself as an influencer in order to talk about abolition and, and, and to talk about suffrage. And, and, and so I want to ask you about this idea of, of light and shadow in, in your practice. Um, in the kind of questions that you're asking and how those questions either land or other work that you are making to be able to introduce those questions, to keep yourself current in the marketplace if that is all a concern. And I understand that this is probably one of those really loaded questions, but it is something that I think about often because I'm also interested in the ways in which the market recognizes especially black artistic production and usually very late in the life of even a virtuosic um, artist sometimes, 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 and, and often um, closer towards maybe, um, uh, maybe the end cap or the capstone of their practice. So I know that that's loaded and, and I apologize for that, but it is a real serious um, question and interest that I have in terms of light and shadow in contemporary black cultural production or artistic production. So however you wanna, however that lands for you, whatever part lands for you. I'll go first since I have the mic. Um, I think about the underdog a lot. I think about the people who are in the shadows in a lot of conversations. Um, I also think that a lot of the times that is black women or black femme presenting people. Um, and so when I think about shadows and when I think about light, I'm thinking about the lives who aren't recognized. Um, or aren't celebrated or aren't remembered. Um, this is the underdog to me. Um, I'm always thinking about the ways to bring the shadow into the light. Um, I'm also thinking about ways of disrupting the the gaze or the, the audience's view on these subjects as well. Because um, there's, you know, this, there's this tension between um, hypervisibility and um, not being visible, right, um, that I think we tend to have. Um, a very nuanced way of, of being presented into the world or being viewed in the world. Um, so I'm always thinking about ways of disrupting that and not giving people too much access to that, that, that physical image, but also shining a light on the story um, at the same time. So. Um, it becomes um, an interesting kind of relationship to viewership that kind of happens within the work that I do. Um, but yeah, I'm always thinking about my matriarch. Um, I'm always thinking about how the people that work the hardest usually earn the least. Um, and for this particular exhibition and the work that I decided to choose for this exhibition um, was of course based on domesticity um, and that labor that was put into Chicago as a whole um, and how those women um, domestic workers have never been recognized um, as much as we see the Pullman porters per se um, and so I decided to shine the light on, the, on these people um, since I've done that project, I've recognized that um, there are more, there is more being said about these women. Um, there is more being um, taught about these women in their work. There's actually an, an exhibition up right now um, at the, um, it's not the New Bauer, but it's the library downtown. It's an independent library. I forgot the name of it. Newberry? Newberry, not Newbar, Newberry, yes. Um, there's an exhibition about the, the Pullman domesticity um, and, or the domestic workers um, 
in their lives, their intimate lives, and in their interior lives. And I thought that was so interesting because this is the first time I've ever heard about, you know, these women outside of the work that they did. The for woman sure. maids, right? Yeah, so the woman maids. The the um, so I, I mean, I'm not sure if I had anything to do with that. Maybe the universe mm -hmm. heard me in wanting to recognize these women. Um, maybe not, but <laughs> maybe it's just, you know, ironic that it happened. But I think, you know, it's serendipitous for me um, to see more happening. I know the uh, Pullman Museum on the South Side is also expanding um, and incorporating information about these women now. Um, so, it's, you know, all this happening after, you know, I've kind of finished this project is, um, I don't know, it's, it, it feels good, you know, it's, it feels good to hear that um, what I brought to light is also being brought to light by other people. Um, so that collective kind of understanding and, you know, and how we see light or how we see people in light. Yes, absolutely. That was really awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, my relationship with light and shadow, um, like I was really drawn to that um, Sojourner um, note. Um, like the way that I look at it is like, um, I learned kind of very early on that there wasn't or there was a very hard market for digital based artworks. Um, like I remember back in like the early 2010s, people were trying to figure out how to like sell websites and documentations of video and things of that nature. So I kind of realized early on that like, I probably will not be um, uh, like a very commercially successful artist in that type of way, um, just because of like my form of medium. Um, so the way that I look at like the relationship between light and shadow is like, my art practice is like shining a light on something that I'm trying to figure out. And then the shadow that results from that is, um, is like finding a way to like package that into something that can then sustain my life. Um, and what I've learned is um, I like actually like built like a creative studio and a company around that in order to do so. And I realized that like the most commercial way for me to like exist and sort of like take that shadow and make a living out of it is in the audio world and the audio storytelling and podcasting world. Um, and then what I've ended up doing is, you know, I'm I'm queer, I I'm non-binary, and I make sure to like focus on like those stories um, in like my day work with um, like telling stories about queer and non-binary people, particularly because I feel like. You know they are very much lost in the shadows um so yeah that's like my kind of relationship back and forth between the two mm -hmm. thank you uh thinking about light and shadow i think the most immediate thing that comes to mind is uh, a rather formal approach uh, as i uh, cannot escape uh, representation uh, I do a lot of work in portrait work and just thinking in general about how light uh, creates form, you know? Yeah. Um, briefly, I think about, uh, you know, a number of artists, uh, Norman Lewis, you know, and thinking about how amazing he was uh, as this representative artist and then uh, moving to abstraction and I'm, I'm really trying to understand you know, uh, the the creation of the image and the gaze and, and, you know, is it safer to be abstract? You know, do, do we do we have a certain liberty, uh, you know, to, to speak a certain way? Um, and... Uh, That's a I'll, huge question right there. Yeah, I, I, I could probably go into depth, I feel like, with that. Um, but uh, I think I'm being a little hard-headed, you know? Uh, and uh, I want to push through uh, representation despite, uh, I think, the commodifying of these kind of imagery uh, that are being produced and uh, massively sold, you know, I, 
I, I wanted to be naive about that mm -hmm. uh, until I found that I too was becoming, uh, or my work uh, was was really becoming a part of that. And mm -hmm. and uh, again, I'm going back and, and asking the purpose of why I'm creating these things, you know. Um, and I think that I found uh, perhaps some form of comfort um, when I began to uh, embrace uh, this kind of digital media, uh, you know, space. Uh, my paintings inspired from that. Mm -hmm. uh, thinking about these public images and what they meant to families, as opposed to how they serve a purpose publicly. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, surveillance culture and things of that nature, and kind of like the duality of that and what that image is. Um, I still kind of question. Uh, you know, how, you know, can I create a form uh, of, you know, my, my family, my friends and folk without it being so loaded, you know, and uh, I don't have the answers. However, uh, I'm not, I'm not really attempting to escape and uh, necessarily lose definition and form uh, by a dim in that light, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, you know, <laughs> I think, uh, similar to uh, what James is talking about, uh, in terms of this kind of balance and in, in regards as uh, this kind of digital commercial practice in some ways, um, there is that kind of safety and there's that nine to five that I cut on and cut off. As a matter of fact, I think I learned uh, a practice uh, by Keisha that you had shared in terms of, you know, a bunch of email practices. And I was like, that's smart. You know, but <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, I want to say that um, I, leave, I leave that nine to five digital, you know, kind of practice there. And uh, I moonlight quietly, you know, as I once did uh, prior to uh, you know, this residency and, and so forth. So, you know, I have my art studio and I draw and I paint. And uh, uh, very, very few people see it. I mean, you see things, but, you know, <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know where, you know, but that's, that's my light and shadow. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, you know, as we go to Delano and get ready to maybe queue up, I don't know, David, to get ready to queue up Lola. I want to, I'm thinking about something just now is that I'm wondering if the same ontology or the same worldview that utters, um, that utters black is beautiful, right, in the 60s also makes representation in the, in 20, in the 21st century necessary, right? I'm just thinking about that because I, I think that there, there's still something that, um, that we want the world to see, you know, and and it feels like um, abstraction is necessary because it's language yes. and mark making. Representation is necessary because it's language and mark making. But there's something there that I hadn't connected the dots that I want to play with. Delano, light and shadow. Okay, so right now I would say light to me uh, is what's quick. Mm -hmm. So like um, like a tweet telling you about what happened down the block, man gets shot, and that's all you get. And then you think you know what's going on. But in the shadow are the details. Mm -hmm. The details exist as to what transpired. How did this person find themselves in a space where they were shot? Um, the history to whoever shot them, all of these different things. That all exists in the shadow. Because we've come to a point in life where people just don't have the time to slow down. Um, you want it quick, you want it immediate, and then you don't really care to you know, see what, 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 what's behind it. Um, and so that's how I sort of operate with light and shadow. Um, and that, it asks a lot of the audience mm -hmm. because it's the immediate that's up there, that shine, that brilliance. Um, you can see that and walk away and that's totally fine. Or you could sit there and meditate on it and you can see the shadow that it's casting. And that's hopefully, I hope that's what you're actually gonna do. Um, talking about the monetary aspect of stuff, uh, any artist who, all right, that's too general, but there are people, there's a faction of the art world that would say like, you shouldn't be making your work to make money. Like that's, that's you know, the wrong thing to do. I would love to just have my practice and not have to teach. If I could live off of the paintings, then fabulous. If someone else is an artist and they wanna turn that down, hey, good luck. I hope things work out for you. 
but you can't separate the two. You know, I have tons of students in school who think that they are not supposed to make money off their art, and I go, whoever told you that is wrong, okay? You have to build a sustainable practice, however that is. So if it means you work at McDonald's, and then you, you know, paint in your bedroom, great. If it means that your work is capturing a moment and people love it, and you can only, you only have to paint, fantastic. But um, you have to be practical. You have to be realistic. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, yes, yes, of course, please. Can I, can I just say the light and shadow thing? Can I just say something? Yes, please. I'm just, I was sitting here and I was like, also, there's this back row of performance people <laughs> who think very specifically about light and shadow. Um, and I think it's such a good question, and I loved hearing how everybody was responding to it in your in your forms. I think for me, mm -hmm. as a person and like other performance folks, we really know about our bodies and light mm -hmm. and what that does to our bodies. And then all the stuff that happens outside of that 90 minutes where we're in shadow, mm -hmm. which I think speaks to your point, mm -hmm. that we know about the light that's actually lived in the shadows. I've been very interested for a long time in the shadow. I kind of feel like that's that's the shit. Yeah. I kind of feel like that's where, and you know, the more I think about it, I think about how we already know this. You know, like Bell Hooks taught us this, right? Glissant taught us this. Maroon colonies taught us this. Yeah. We already know that actually that space, that hidden space, there's so much power in there. There's something really interesting about that Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass thing, yeah. the like using that to kind of get to where you need to go, using that light, using that flash of light to get what you need to have happen. And at the same time, I think the shadow is actually like the stuff for us. Yeah. I think the shadow is the stuff. Yeah. I, I you know, it's a lot. I want to ask y'all, I'm just going to put everybody, because that's like I mean, community here for a minute mm -hmm. before we get ready to, to watch uh, Lola. First of all, as we get ready, I want to hear what y'all have to say, but please give a hand to our Okay, Lola said we don't have to see the slides, but that's what I want to. I want to, but we'll, we'll see. Maybe we can turn them as we get ready to leave. But one of the things that I um, just want to say is that um, I, I am always um, so interested and always want to be wherever I can hear artists talk about their work and process. There is so much that um, is in there, and you have evidence that today. I'm participating in the conversation, but I'm also listening and going other places. So I just want to thank you all so much, and thank you for giving and giving and giving in all of these different ways. Um, but I do want to, if we're not going to uh, end with right here with Lola's slides, and although I'm going to ask that they be played, I would like uh, Yao to maybe contribute to this idea of light and, and shadow from your perspective, mm -hmm. um, especially because you're working with photography, you know, mm -hmm. too. And then I want to close with asking each of you a very quick sort of outro about, about light. So, Yao. So, uh, thanks for asking. Uh, in my home, me and my wife, we talk about images that our children see. And we also talk about how, um, how for so long there's been a legacy and a history of um, kind of uh, s s uh, second classness, third class, it's a legacy. You know, when you see like, um, uh, people of color that are like on top of the game. It's like, whoop, whoop, whoop. it's not like a, mm -hmm. you know, it's, you know, it, it, it's also not true, right? So in my home, uh, something we did and something that I, um, uh, one of, was one of my art pieces is we actually colored the um, the children's books, we you know made them you know some made them brown, you know. So I put in, uh, in one of the uh, my artworks. There were like all these um, 
Dr. Seuss yes. books, and then I put um, crayons, colored pencils, and just gave people the opportunity to color. Um, but we're really interested in like the people that my children see. Um, sure, we live in a very diverse world, but the first people that they see that are intelligent and compassionate, et cetera, et cetera, all these beautiful things. We want them to be black. We want them to be brown. We want, we want them to see them. We want them to be comfortable with seeing that. Right? Um, so um, the, the photos that I presented are my children, and you just see the light you see is their eyes. Yes, beautiful. Or with my daughter, you see like the sparkle of her, you know, her uh, earring. Her earring. Um, but I want her to be comfortable. I want them to be comfortable with knowing that intelligence and um, superiority, uh, um, grandness, doesn't live over there. It lives in your house. Mm -hmm. You know, so. Um, Light and dark for me is, is kind of a place where I can play with the notion of where, where darkness is beautiful. You know, the, the, the thing is, is um, the fact that we even have to do that is crazy. The fact that we have this, that I have to say, hey man, hey man, black is beautiful. It's, 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 it's a wild thing. Um, but still, um, it's an important thing yep. because of these times. Right. So, um, uh, so darkness is is the place where I can say, "This is this is grand. Yep. This is wonderful." <laughs> you know, uh, and light in that respect is just um, uh, the tools by which. We see it, mm. you know. Yep. So light becomes a tool to shine the light on dark, on the darkness. Um, so yes, yeah. yeah. No, I think that goes back to what Martine is saying about using. You know, we've thought about light as time up here. We've thought about light as space, right? Um, um, and how do we use? How do we understand um, how fertile um, and generative the shadow is? You know, um, as we close, I just want to thank you too for your patience. Um, at this point in my life, I'm beginning to think how important it is that we document moments like these. Right? And I'm so happy um, because this constellation, including all of you and all the amazing artists in this room as well, and all the amazing contributors to Chicago, we may never be in this type of physical space in this constellation. This is a particular moment in time. So I really want to thank you for allowing the space necessary. But um, as Yao was alluding to, we have a lot of definitions of light um, in the exhibition. We have the definition of light meaning to radiate heat or energy. Uh, we have the definition of light um, to make things visible. The definition of light to be easily carried or easily born. Uh, the definition um, of light to ignite uh, and so on. We're working with about five, six definitions of light. As we get ready to close, which, which idea or thought about light um, is resonating for you as you continue your practice, as you continue your work, and as you march towards uh, at least the concept of legacy. Yeah, let's start. Let's, let's work our way back up. All right. Um, I mean, I would just say light is the the definition would be light is the uh, precursor to shadow. Mm. Um, and I think about it. And, I like science, I think about the fact that, uh, like the sun, we are seeing light from the sun that is billions of years old. Uh, not billions, maybe billions, but um, there's so much history about the universe in light. You know, we're seeing this old light, but all that history is right behind it. So, yeah, that's how I sort of see it as a precursor. I 
think um, I'm most grateful each morning to uh, witness light uh, with my family and my daughter. I mean, I, I can't even go any further in depth with that. And I mean, uh, I'm, I'm just most grateful for that. I, I don't take uh, one day for granted. Uh, I literally go to sleep uh, sometimes <laughs> and uh, imagine if, uh, you know, if I were not to experience that light the next day, you know? I mean, I don't, I don't know, it's, it's just me being grateful daily. I think about light as reflection, um, acting as a mirror, and I think about light in the, in the nature of levity. Um, like, I think humor, and, um, and lightness can be a form of like a very important tool to like allow people to like see themselves at work. Um, I see light as knowledge. Um, to see light is to know. It's to know that there are infinite possibilities out there for you. Um, and to know that, you know, sky is the limit. Light is knowledge, and knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. And I'll end there. And we'll let that be the last word. Thank you all so much.